decided that at the end of the day today, we had a few things in store. The first one was that we would like to play um, Nicola Sturgeon's apology. It is quite emotional. So for those of you who are in the room, please bear in mind, you know, if you don't want to watch it, turn down the volume or or turn your screen off. Um, and if obviously um, the numbers are in the chat, if, if you if you need any support. After um, we've watched some of the apology, we won't watch it all. It's a forty minute. Um, it's a forty minute uh, play, so we won't watch it all. We'll just watch the the, the formal apology, um, and then afterwards, our team would like to um, present to you the the actual presentation that we gave to Natalie Don, Minister for Children and Young People for the Scottish Government on Thursday last week. So we will start with the apology, and then we'll move on. But before I will now hand over to Nicola Sturgeon. The next item of business is a statement by Nicola Sturgeon on historical adoption practices. The First Minister will take questions at the end of her statement and so there should be no interventions or interruptions. First Minister. Presenting officer, the issuing of a formal apology is an action reserved by governments as a response to the worst injustices in our history. Without doubt, the adoption practices that prevailed in this country for decades during the 20th century fit that description. And for the people affected by these practices, I appreciate that an apology has been a very long time coming. One of the most ardent campaigners for it has been Marion McMillan. In the mid-1960s, Marion was a teenager living in Stranraer. When she became pregnant, she was sent to a mother and baby home in the north of England. Marion has described the horror of having her son taken away from her. I remember crying and telling them that I'm his mummy and begging them not to take my son. I was told not to be silly, I'd get over it, and I could always have other babies when I was married. Elspeth Ross faced her own ordeal. In 1962, she gave birth to her son in a mother and baby home in Glasgow. After I had my son, I was in the nursery for six weeks looking after him, but nobody told me they were taking him away. I was upstairs the very last day and told to pack my bags and go, not knowing that I was never seeing my son again. In 1979, Jano Farmer gave birth at the age of 22. She has recounted the moment in the hospital when she was told that her baby was being adopted. I was treated in quite humiliating ways from the outset. I didn't understand at that time that I had lost the decision, that the decision had been made for me. I didn't understand that until the social worker appeared after the birth. The horror of what happened to these women is almost impossible to comprehend. It is the stuff of nightmares, yet these were not isolated cases, far from it. Until the late 1970s, forced adoption was a relatively common practice in Scotland. Many thousands of children were subject to it. In most cases, their mothers were young or unmarried. They were stigmatised as a result and they were forced or coerced into the adoption process by charities, churches, health professionals, and social services. Some mothers suffered physical mistreatment or abuse. Some were denied appropriate health care. Up until the early 1970s, mothers in some cases were given Stilbestrol, a drug that dried up their breast milk and which is potentially carcinogenic. Virtually all of the mothers were made to feel worthless. Among many falsehoods, they were told that they had nothing to offer their child except state benefits. They were told that without adoption, their child would grow up a delinquent and that they were selfish for wanting to keep their baby because they would be denying them a so-called better life. Consistently, mothers were lied to about the adoption process. 
They were given no information about what was happening. When they did object, they were bullied or ignored. Some women were never even allowed to hold their babies. Most never got the chance to say a proper goodbye. And many were threatened with terrible consequences if they ever tried to make contact with their child. For these mothers, it was a living nightmare, a nightmare from which they've never truly been able to wake. The grief, heartbreak and shame of what happened has been a constant throughout their lives. And many have had to bear this trauma in silence for fear of other people's judgment or pity. It has affected their relationships, relationships with subsequent children, with partners and with family and friends. And for many, it has created serious mental health impacts that persist to this very day. For the sons and daughters who were taken, of course, the impacts have also been profound. Now, it is important to say, and to say very clearly, that many of them went to loving homes. Acknowledging these injustices should never be seen as a rejection of the deep bonds that people share with their adopted families. Nothing can ever invalidate the love that these families have for one another. But it is also clear that many of those affected, far too many, had a very, very different experience. We know some will always have lacked a sense of belonging. Some may even have suffered mistreatment or abuse. And all of them will have grown up believing that their mothers chose to put them up for adoption of their own free will. Understandably, that has affected them, and yet it was never true. As adults, the practical difficulties of accessing adoption records have been a further torment. Even when families have been able to reconnect, that in itself has brought huge emotional challenges. And sometimes the search has ended in further heartache when the person being looked for is already deceased. For the fathers affected, there has also been great suffering. They too lost a child. They too had their rights denied by a system that ignored and dehumanised them. There's good reason to believe that some mothers weren't even allowed to put the father's names on the birth certificate, a permanent obstacle to reuniting with their son or daughter. And of course, the impact of what happened has been felt more widely by the loved ones of everyone involved. The legacy of these practices continues to affect generations of families in this country and beyond. It is a level of injustice which is hard now for us to comprehend. So today, how do we even begin to explain how such appalling acts could take place? Obviously, they were the product of a society where women were regarded as second-class citizens, where unmarried mothers were stigmatised, and where people in authority had too much power. We also know that similar practices happened in other countries. But that does not, for a moment, excuse the appalling mistreatment people suffered nor does it absolve the individuals and institutions involved. After all, it is not just in hindsight that these practices are wrong. Mistreating women and forcing them to part with their babies was never right. It was always cruel, unjust and profoundly wrong. Now, there's a line of argument which says that because the government of the time did not support these practices, there's nothing to apologise for. And that anyway, these events took place long ago before this parliament reconvened and anyone in this chamber held public office. But these are not reasons to stay silent. Ultimately, it is the state that is morally responsible for setting standards and protecting people. So as modern representatives of the state, I believe we, amongst others, have a special responsibility to the people affected. First, we have a responsibility to do whatever we can to support them in dealing with the legacy of what happened. That's why last year the Scottish Government established specialist support and counselling services for those affected by historical adoption practices. At the same time, we launched a consultation asking people affected to share their experiences. I want to take this opportunity today to thank everyone who responded. We have since commissioned a study which will report later this summer on how we can improve the support that people can access
from psychological support to help in reuniting with family members. And we will continue to explore with those affected the key challenges that they face with regard to adoption records and the lasting health impacts faced by mothers who were given still be strong. On that final point, I want to emphasise again today the importance of women attending routine breast and cervical screening appointments. Another responsibility we have to them, of course, is to provide an assurance that the lessons of this period have been learned. There's no doubt that adoption practices and our society in general have come a long way in the decades since, but we can never, ever allow ourselves to be complacent. At all times, we must ensure that the services which are meant to protect families fulfil that role as effectively and compassionately as possible. That's why this government is so focused on delivering the conclusions of the independent care review, the promise which emphasised the importance, where possible, of keeping families together. And more generally, we need to continue to build a society where women and girls are treated equally and where everyone's human rights are respected. That has always been a central mission of this government and it is how we ensure that such injustices never happen again. The final way in which we can keep faith with those affected is more symbolic, but no less meaningful for that. It is something that has been campaigned for tirelessly over many years by many of the people seated in our gallery today. And it's a cause which I know has been championed by members across this chamber. As a government and a parliament, we can set the record straight. We can acknowledge the terrible wrongs that were done. And we can say with one voice that we are sorry. So today, as First Minister, on behalf of the Scottish Government, I say directly to the mothers who had their babies taken away from them, to the sons and the daughters who were separated from their parents, to the fathers who were denied their rights, and to the families who have lived with the legacy. For the decades of pain that you have suffered, I offer today a sincere, heartfelt and unreserved apology. We are sorry. No words can ever make up for what has happened to you, but I hope this apology will bring you some measure of solace. It is the very least that you deserve, and it is long overdue. to watch the rest of um, Nicola's speech and the uh, Q&A given by the MSPs afterwards is quite interesting and it's definitely worth a watch and a lot of what we've been talking about over the last two days are obviously in, in those questions. Hello, I'm Fiona. I was born Samantha Jane in care in 1982. I'm care experience and a forced adoption adult adoptee in reunion. I'm also a wife and a mother of two. I've been unseen and unsupported throughout my life as an adoptee. After years of being wrongly diagnosed with bipolar, unheard by all and under acknowledged, I had a mental health breakdown. I have now been in therapy for the past two and a half years and been diagnosed with complex post-traumatic stress disorder due to adoption trauma. The day I collapsed into an office of the NHS Mental Health Hospital, I told my therapist these words. If I don't need locked up, then I think I need to sit down and talk to Nicola Sturgeon. First, I had to get myself better. And during that time, I reached out to the darkness. And one day, I found my tribe reaching back. Hello, I'm Sarah Louise. I was born in 1975. I spent the first seven years of my life with my birth family, and then I entered the care, the care system. During the next seven years, there were a lot of changes to where I lived and who I was living with. And each change also brought with it a new school and a set of classmates. I lived in two foster care homes and one children's home before eventually being placed were the people who adopted me. I had always understood that I had been adopted by this couple when I started living with them at the age of nine or 10. 
but I'm still unclear as an adult if I had been fostered for the first four years and had not been adopted until the age of 14. And again, because of trauma, um, the timelines of my age and the changes in my life disrupts uh, my own understanding of my identity. The death of my adopted father led to a further severance and my adoption becoming further disrupted and this has now led to estrangement. I am a single parent to my school-aged daughter. We moved um, uh, away to begin a new life in 2016. It has been a struggle with little recognition and support from services for me as a care experienced adult adoptee, which I now um, support the campaign for lifelong with Who Cares. And to this day, I still don't know if my adoption was forced or not. On to you, Naomi. Thanks, Sarah. Hi, I'm Lindsay. I was born in 1965. That was slap bang in the middle of the forced historical adoption practices. I always knew the words to say, I am adopted, but I didn't understand what that meant until my twenties, when firstly, I learned that on my birth certificate, I'm registered as existing with a name that I had never heard before. And secondly, I gave birth to my daughter and experienced from the perspective of a birth mother, what a natural bond and attachment is. As my daughter grew up, I was keen to connect the dots for her of the multiple family systems we emerged from. Everywhere I turned for support had either nothing to offer me, it was a dead end, or I was met with active dismissal, or I was asked to provide support to other adult adoptees. You might like to call me grateful and what I am grateful for is that I have the good fortune to be here at this time with this group of fellow adoptees, and that includes anybody who's watching this later, who are committed to the practice of personal and societal truth-seeking and truth-telling. Karina, if you'd like to go next, please. Thank you, Lindsay. Hi, I'm Karina. Um, I was born in 1969, um, fostered and then adopted. I reclaimed my original name this year, which with an official name change, which feels like the right thing to do for very many reasons. I'm in reunion with both my natural first mother and father's family since I was 19. And at this time, I began to have self-worth really for the very first time. But reunion is no fairy tale ending for anyone due to the blame, the shame, the guilt, the grief, and just the lost time and lost community that we've had and that we can't recapture. My Northern Irish mother was 21 when she had me and wanted to keep me, but her consultant obstetrician father well, he'd been part of the state-sanctioned socio-medical adoption pipeline of healthy infants to infertile middle-class couples for decades. And sadly, he refused to let her keep me or to support us. While she fought to keep me, I went from hospital to foster care and adoption. And my social work reports say I cried a lot. Um, no wonder I was crying to be found by her. Um, she was, as, as uh, we learned earlier today uh, from Maggie Mellon, my, uh, my life support system. I had a couple of uh, mental health breakdowns at ages of 19 and 26. Um, and being over 25, there wouldn't have been any support for me or for anyone like me currently approaching that age just now. I was lucky enough to be able to afford support for myself. But if I hadn't been able to work, then yeah, I would have really, really struggled and I don't want to think about what might have happened. So that's a little bit about us and we're now going to move on and I'll ask you on um, for a bit more about what we presented to Scottish Government. Thanks, Nick. So in our presentation, uh, we're just going to run through the entire thing as we said it to Natalie Dawn. 
So you are hearing exactly the words that were said to the Minister of Children and Young People. Presentation will move forward as we're going through. As the only Scottish grassroots organisation representing the rights, interests and well-being of adult adoptees Scotland-wide, we are pleased to meet with you, Natalie Dawn, and to share our adult adoptee rights presentation with you. Sam has been working as a peer-to-peer -peer support network and a lobbying organisation promoting the rights and interests of the adult adoptee community in Scotland since 2021. Sam was galvanised by the outcomes of the Joint Committee of Human Rights and the Scottish Government's Child Abuse Inquiry and the lack of publicity, publicly available information on this. In both of these important inquiries, there was a profound lack of recognition of the highly relevant circumstances, needs and issues faced by all adult adoptees. In response to this lack, SAM members created our recommendations and core circumstances paper in the autumn of 2022. On the 2nd of March 2023, we were present in Holyrood when the former First Minister issued her sincere, heartfelt and unreserved apology on behalf of the Scottish Government to all affected by what Nicola Sturgeon described as a living nightmare of historic forced adoptions. Sam has observed with keen interest as monies have been committed to certain organisations but with little observed impact upon those eligibly more affected by adoption practices, the adoptees themselves. Psychologists and neuroscientists now understand and can identify the developmental trauma experienced by those adopted in infancy and childhood. This trauma shapes the developing brain of an infant and the behaviours of toddlers and children. What we now know from adoption trauma is that adoption is not a happening nor an event. Adoption confers a lifelong series of separations, crises, attachment issues, and neurological impacts upon the adoptee, no matter the circumstances of their adoption. Our presentation today will demonstrate that in effect, adoption remains for many a living nightmare and even a life sentence. Sam presents our three key asks. The Scottish Adoptee Bill of Rights. Our aims are to convince you of the gaps in current policy, practice and legislation, and to work together to improve life in Scotland for all adult adoptees. What would make adult adoptees' lives better? Well, dignity, respect and recognition. That gives us our starting point. So many important and worthy policy and legal documents are blind and deaf to the experiences of adoptees. There's no dignity in not knowing that you're adopted when you are. There's no respect in being told that your trauma is not as politically important as someone else's trauma. And there's no recognition in having your adoptee status mean nothing to health and social care professionals. When all the evidence is there to confirm the impact of lifelong adoption trauma on mental and physical health. Sam calls for the human rights, welfare and well-being of all adoptees in childhood, teenage transition and adulthood to be restored, protected and promoted. When dignity, respect and recognition have become restored, protected and promoted, we know we will have achieved Sam's aims, but we have a way to go. Sam have spent a lot of time considering and consulting on what our recommendations and core circumstances boil down to. Here are our collected aims. The right to know. The right to autonomy and the right to be known. The first key ask, the right to know. As I said when I first introduced myself, I have the privilege of always knowing the words to say, I am adopted. Yet it takes the living of a life to understand what these words actually mean. 
There are layers and layers which adoptees in society alike struggle to understand of the ongoing impactful process which is set in motion when a child is adopted. I wasn't even a late discovery adoptee, but many are. To this day, people in their 50s and 60s are learning for the first time that they are adopted. It's hard to imagine that this circumstance has been created. If the ancient Greek extra, ex, saying to know thyself is fundamental to good citizenship, the puzzle of a state creating conditions that impede its citizens from knowing themselves is, at best, paradoxical. Adult adoptees desire to have the dignity of having the right to know of our own adoptive status. Also, to know of our birth lineage, language, community and culture, and to know of our genetics and medical history. All these things are not only to know for ourselves, but also for what we pass down to future generations. Any rights of other people to know about us have to be balanced with adoptees' rights to be informed of, have ready access to, and ownership of their own information. The second key ask, the right to autonomy. Adoptees are supposed to be the ones adoption is about, but history has shown us that the needs of society and the infertile couples repeatedly trump vulnerable and voiceless young adoptees. Sadly, legislation concludes in working against adoptees failing to put adoptees' human rights at the fore and meeting the needs of others in the adoption triad rather than adoptees' needs being placed into a family when we have no choice over this has been linked to imprisonment, enslavement and human trafficking by some high-profile international adoptee advocates. For example, the two-year suspension on international adoptions that the government of the Netherlands put in place when they could not tell which international adoptions were and which were not legal. However it is viewed, the facts remain that it is impossible for an adoptee to exit their legally sanctioned adoption without placing blame and providing abuse. And there is presently no way for an adoptee to be legally reunited with their first family or as part of a blended family. Conflicts and confusion abound, with the adoptee at the centre with the least power. As we have seen over recent conf conflicts with first mother's rights to know. And as we move on to the right to be known, it's the recognition of state accountability Building upon UNCRC, leading the way in human rights for Scotland, all adoptees as looked after and previously looked after care experienced people. Inclusion of adoptees of all ages as having protected characteristics. We need to develop and expand evidence-based practice supported by research, adults with trauma, CPTSD, without workforce, education, judicial health and social care, a rights to and needs of lifelong support as a result of and or following institutionalised mm -hmm. care. So the third key ask is the right to be known, as I've said, and adoptees are treated like Scotch mist in the various reviews of child and legislative policy and practice. Simply stated, adult adoptees were placed into families as the most vulnerable points in their lives and left to sink or swim. Our recommendations and core circumstances paper set out some of the growing evidence base into adoptee experience and adoption outcomes. Time after time, regardless of the circumstances of adoption, adoptees are demonstrated as having poorer life expectancy, greater mental and physical health concerns, greater risk of criminal justice involvement and greater risk of addiction and loss of life by suicide. This is the life sentence of adoption. How much less of a burden could this sentence be if all agencies involved in the support, treatment and care of adoptees understood the impact of adoption? Sam seeks the Scottish Government's support 
to turn this around through the implementation of protective characteristics, currently being motioned through various local councils. This can be achieved by incorporating adult adoptees to help differentiate between care experienced young people and older people beyond the age of 25. It is essential that we make the conversation of, oh, I'm adopted, but I don't suppose it matters, or no, it doesn't, we don't collect that data into a thing of the past. All the evidence tells us is that it does matter. We need to collect the data and we need to respond to the needs of adult adoptees. This all fits with the protective characteristics of previously looked after people and has relevance for the Scottish Child Abuse Inquiry. Next slide. Um, Sam requests that the Scottish Government prioritise the legislative groundwork and the legislative changes to include this Bill of Rights with a view to significantly improving the lives of adult adoptees. Sam is not advocating that adoption should be stopped, although we look with interest at the guardianship taking place in other parts of the world and the benefits this confers. And we do recognise that it may be necessary for children to be looked after in homes other than their kinship care homes. And for some children, we want to make sure that they, they have the best option. But we do assert that adoption should be considered only after lengthy and appropriate support to natural parents and kinship carers, and should never involve an identity change unless for the express safeguarding of the child or children. However, our collective adult adoptee experience, backed by academic evidence, gives a perspective that children in dependent relationships with adoptive parents cannot begin to foresee or tell of. We have the lived experience and we know the paths and the pitfalls of adoptees experienced at all ages. Next slide, please. This is not a Scotland-centric problem, as we've heard from many people over the last two days. Adult adoptees from around the world have been campaigning for their rights to be respected and upheld. Scotland can learn from our fellow nations and lead the way in the UK in terms of how adoptees' human rights are honoured. We close our presentation by requesting that the Scottish Government commit to the three key asks. Sam seeks to work with the Scottish Government to integrate the UNCRC and to work with the Promise and to collaborate with others to implement a Scottish Adoptee Bill of Rights. Supported by our recommendations and core circumstances document, collectively we can offer lifelong choice to adoptees to minimise the traumatic impacts of adoption and to restore natural justice to all those whose rights have been overlooked or undermined. Thank you very much. But we did this on our own and we did it because we had to. Um, we don't take away from 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 what anybody else is doing and, and we never want to do that. But what we do want to do is make our position very clear. We are here, we are listening, and we will work hard to make sure that some changes come for adoptees. Thank you very much for everything and every single one of you has watched for the last two days. None of this, none of this, none of what we do, none of what we say, none of what you know, how we how we progress would happen if it had not been for each and every single adoptee who speaks out, who voices their opinion, whether it be social media, whether it be in a book, whether it be in research, whether it be just online or TikTok, we're listening and we will fight to make change. Once again, thank you from me and thank you to my amazing team who I could not have done it without them. Thank you so much. Yeah.